Hi, good morning, guys. How are we doing today? Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Yeah, sorry about the late start. We had some technical difficulties at the institute. We were expecting some persons in class, but they're not here as yet. And we had a bit of a task getting online. So bear, bear with us. The internet is a bit shaky this morning. But um, welcome to the second part of um, International Compliance Association, AML. Um, most of you I'm already familiar with because you would have, you know, come to intro as well as intermediate. But for those who are not familiar, I'm, I'm Ms. Bullard. Um, we're going to be covering um, chapters nine and 10 and 11. Um, I would have gone through um, the pages and I see is about 108 pages that we will cover. So there are four classes. So over the next four weeks, we are going to perhaps go through at least 25 pages and that should take us into um, the, the final class. And I think it's, um, does everybody have a schedule and uh, familiar with the dates? That's from what is today, February 27th until um, March 25th. Okay, so each week we will um, go through at least 25 pages. So of course, you know, um, Ms. Sands would have taken you through the first part and at this point, we should know what's required of each of us. Um, do I need to go through it? Everybody knows that each week we will read and it's discussion based. Is everybody on track with that by now or, or do we need some help? But definitely the ones from intro and, and intermediate know that it's discussion based. So each week we'll cover 25 pages. Okay, did anybody have the opportunity to read? Yes, anybody? Any, okay, and from yes, your okay, from your readings, um, do you have any questions right off the bat after you would have read chapter nine? No questions so far. No, no questions so far. Okay, Jensen, how, how are you? No. Okay, good, good. Okay, good. So of course, um, if you would have attended um, intermediate, you would know by now what a risk-based approach is and what's included in, in that. And a risk-based risk approach. Sorry, somebody said something. Said... No, okay. So again, a risk-based approach um, in chapter nine, it starts off with you know, where does this risk-based approach recommendation come from? And by now we should all be familiar with the 40 recommendations from the FATF. Are we all familiar? Right now, I need some feedback. Come on guys. Yes, ma'am. We're all familiar, okay. And so we all know by now the very first recommendation, which is recommendation one from the 40 recommendations asked us to assess our country risk and they want us to assess the risks within our country and then put controls in place to mitigate that risk. So by, by now everybody should be familiar with recommendation one and, and what it requires. And so countries should do an assessment and understand the money laundering and terrorist financing risk that is associated with their country. And again, for those who, of you who are familiar, we should know by now that this is an international standard. So recommendation one is from the ATF 40 recommendations. And then we have country law, which would be Bahamian law. Each country would have had to put this into place. Does anybody know in Bahamian law, which section of the Bahamian law re requires us to um, complete this country risk assessment? Anybody familiar? No. no, no response, no Samoan and um, Maria, uh, we're not familiar with which, which, which law in the Bahamas has been done in place. The FTRA. Yes, correct. So the FTRA um, section five talks about the risk assessment and that's what makes it mandatory in Bahamian law. And then of course, from Bahamian law, then we have our regulators guidelines. And so our regulators guidelines then irons out what exactly we need to do because most of the time 
as we know, the law is not in layman's terms. And so we go to the guideline, whether you're licensed by the Securities Commission, the Central Bank, the Insurance Commission, each one of those regulators should have an AML guideline and it should tell you exactly what is to be done. So of course, we know a little bit of the history. All of these laws came out in 2000. The Bahamas only put in a shell. In 2018, everything was revamped and repealed. And now we're in an era of enforcement. So no longer are we you know, having laws in place and they're not being enforced. And we know right out of this um, recommendation one, um, the regulators are now enforcing it. And through that enforcement, um, the central bank had to create a analytics department, the securities commission created a analytics department. And again, all of this is so that we can have a hands-on approach or they can have a hands-on approach to ensure that what is required internationally is being carried out. And so gone are the days when, you know, we put these laws in place, nobody understands it. There's no training surrounding it and we bypass it every day. And we, you know, just don't do it. Now it's being enforced. And so therefore, um, each, like I said, regulator created that analytics department so they can have that hands-on approach with each financial institution. Okay. And so each financial institution now has a relationship manager where they have to you know, that's, they're checking, they're following up and they're ensuring that what is required is actually being carried out. In fact, in terms of dates, um, back in 2019, because it wasn't enforced, there were um, deadlines set. And so in June of 2019, the AML risk assessment had to be done for each financial institution. And then in October of that same year, an enterprise-wide risk assessment had to be done for um, each institution. And if that was not completed, there were fines levied against each financial institution. And some of those fines were daily. Um, some could have been up to $5,000, depending on the size of the um, organization. Okay, so again, a hands-on approach. Um, we're being internationally watched. Um, we had a mutual evaluation in 2017 where the IMF, sorry, the CFATF came in and they found that we were deficient in 22 of those 40 recommendations. So of course, um, that's why we had to revamp, repeal and update a lot of our laws to ensure that we become compliant internationally. Okay, so is, is that clear so far? Are we all comfortable with Recommendation one, do we understand the requirements? Countries should assess their risk and then they should put controls in place. And so I attended a seminar back in, um, in 2009 that just talks about the different types of risks that the Bahamas um, has to deal with. And so in our risk assessment, I don't know if everybody would have been familiar with our risk assessment, but our risk assessment is a little behind this is the current risk assessment. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? No. No? Okay, just one second. Let me share the screen. It's up there, right? Okay, one second. Okay, one second. I have to get, um, they have disabled, so it's only showing in the class. So. Currently on the screen, I have the 2015-2016 um, risk assessment up on the screen. Um, some of you can Google it. Excuse me one second. Let me get them. Yeah. So most of you can just go to Google and, and um, pull it up. Um, and so the last time we would have completed um, our overall country risk assessment was in 2015 and 2016. And normally I just go to the table of contents to look at um, what's included. And as you can see, it's very um, limited. 
and what's included. If we think back to 250 and 216, I need to share the screen for you. If we think back to 215 and 216, we would know that that was around the time when the gaming board was approving uh, gaming houses for the first time. So the gaming houses are listed in here. However, you know, there's limited information. Again, back before 218, this was accepted. It was accepted that we only had in the shell. It was accepted that, you know, um, you know, 22 were deficient. Um, it was ac ac accepted to a certain point because, of course, you know, along the lines, we were blacklisted. We always remained on a gray list for a very long time. So in 2017, um, it was not only the Bahamas, there was about 31 countries that had their mutual evaluation conducted. And so it was not only the Bahamas that was gravely deficient in, in like how we were deficient in 22. There was also Spain and Germany and France. However, you know, we get a lot of the backlash because we don't have representation on those boards, on the EU, at the OECD, at the FATF. Whereas with those countries, you have the prime minister or the, the governor or the president sitting on that exact board. So of course, when it's time for blacklisting, there's somebody there with the seat at the table to advocate on behalf of their country. And so for a very long time, we didn't have anybody to advocate or speak up for us. So we were being blacklisted without even knowing. And in 2018, in terms of um, reassessing our taxes, we had signed into the T's um, for FACA and CRS and was willing to um, share information with the various governments. However, we were blacklisted because they have a technical department versus an administrative department. And we sent the information to the technical department. They didn't send it to the administrative department in time. And therefore, the Bahamas was blacklisted. So of course, you can imagine that our you know, government was outraged by that because blacklisting does not um, look good on any country. And when countries are blacklisted, um, we find that um, we people don't want to do business with us. And we can, you know, risk becoming high risk, which no country wants to be high risk because when we're the entire risk, of course, we know we have to be subjected to enhanced due diligence. Okay, and so um, I think I um, can share the screen now. I'm just going to try again. Okay. Okay, are we all, all familiar with this risk assessment? Have we seen it before? Yes. No? Okay, and so again, again, just to familiarize you with it and to say exactly what's happening in your own country, this is the risk assessment of 215 and 216. And so what happens is um, once the country would have assessed the risk and they would have put controls in place to mitigate the risk, um, that is the expectation of recommendation one. So assess your country's risk, put controls in place and ensure that the money launderers and the terrorist financiers cannot infiltrate your system. Okay, and so that's the whole point of the country's risk assessment. Okay, so in the Bahamas, they would have accepted this. And at that time, like I said, back in 2015, the Gaming board had not even regulated. We were just having a referendum to decide if we wanted to legalize gaming or not. And so that uh, after this would have been done, then they would have legalized um, gaming. And so each industry has to make a contribution. So the financial services sector is built up of the insurance commission, the central bank, gaming, the gaming board, the compliance commission, and the Securities Commission. So each of those um, regulators has to make a contribution to the country's risk assessment based on what's happening in their sector. So imagine if gaming had just been regulated and then they come up with all this, these requirements, the persons in the gaming area were not trained as yet. They didn't even know they had to do this. 
another um, industry um, was the credit unions. The credit unions weren't even regulated by the central bankers yet. They had self-regulating bodies. And for the first time now, after 218, they had to have an MLRO on staff. Okay, and so again, that's cost, regulation is expensive. And so the, we were on like a learning curve in many of the sectors. Just recently, the Compliance Commission now um, regulates the lawyers, the accounting firms, and the real estate agents that have a corporate service providers arm. Again, they never had to do it before. And so you would find that in this ICA class, there were a lot of lawyers and a lot of persons from the real estate sector popping up, trying to get qualified because they were not able to the next year to get their licenses without the, having that MLRO on staff. And again, depending on the number of customers you have, it can't be a, like a one man band. You know, a lot of persons try to say, okay, I'll hire an MLRO and an assistant, but if you have eight, 900 customers, you need to have proper metrics in place to be able to carry out um, those functions and ensure that, you know, the there's sufficient staff to cover all of the functions and services and products that your, your company offers, okay? And so that's where we are at as a country. And in terms of threats, um, and this is a profile that came out from the Lloyd Douche back in 2019. So again, to the country, um, you know, these were considered the highest money laundering terrorist financing um, threats, which was fraud, inclusive of tax fraud, money laundering, drug trafficking. Of course, all of us are familiar back from in the 80s with the drug um, trafficking problem, and then the domestic crimes that we see. Uh, now that the drug trafficking is gone, we see a lot of gun, guns on the streets almost every day, somebody gets killed. And so all of that um, has to be trafficked in somehow. And so we need to have proper controls in place to find out exactly how these guns are coming in, how they are being trafficked and what is happening. And so that's what the international standard, that's what recommendation one wants. Put controls in place to protect your country against these threats. Okay, and so then the net effect is each institution, all the insurance companies must put the controls in place and create a risk assessment for their business. All the banks, all the credit unions, all the gaming houses, document what your threats are, put controls in place and ensure you are mitigating um, those risks. Okay. Is that clear so far? Are we clear on recommendation one and we understand exactly what they what the expectation is? Yes. 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 Okay. Sure. Okay, yes. good. And so um out of this, and I I you know, my intermediate class would have heard this story before. The net effect of it is once we would have put in this national risk assessment, we would go to the Basel Committee or the Basel Committee, whatever, whichever one you call it. And this is the organization that actually would risk rate the country and determine whether or not we're high, medium, or low. And of course, we know if we are risk rated as high, many countries will not do business with us. Many countries um, will be subjected to, the ones that do business to with us will subject us to enhanced due diligence. And of course, we know there's a difference between simplified and enhanced due diligence. And so therefore, if we're subjected to that, more cost is gonna be involved, um, more deliverables. And again, like I said, um, a lot of countries just simply will not do business with us. And I always tell the story where we tried to bring our trading desks um, from Switzerland. And one of the requirements were, because we had the staff locally in the Bahamas, we wanted to bring our trading desk from Switzerland. However, you know, we had to go into New York and open an account with the Morgan Stanley or one of the, the big banks, the Deutsche Bank. And when we went there, they told us, we don't do business with high risk countries. Now, of course, immediately said, but we're not high risk. So if we look at this again, we see that that's Haiti, and this is the Bahamas right there. 
6.43. And if we look at the legend, where the 6.43, you know, fall, we are borderline high, right? We're one step away from being high, right? And so therefore, um, we were not able to open that account with them because they said, well, show us what the Basel Index says about you. And if we look at the Basel Index, I have the um, Excel rating, you would see in 217, 218, 219, 220, there's no rating. You had to go all the way back to 2014. And so when we pulled this up to show them, because our risk rate, our risk assessment was, that was the last time they would have risk rated us, you know, they didn't accept a 214 rating in 2020. You know, they said, come on, 2020, and, and, and you want us to accept a 214 rating. So we were not able to open that account to be able to bring our trading desk. And now we still continually pay $100,000 plus to Switzerland when we have the staff locally here in the Bahamas. So, so that's we still, had, okay, I was just asking a question. So we still at the 6.43 today? Yeah, today. Um, and let me just show the show you the update. So again, in our House of Assembly, there was riffraff back between the opposition and the government, and the government did send out an update. And this is the update. Can you see it on the screen? And it basically says that um, post completion of the NRA for 215, 216, and 219, the Central Bank and the Compliance Commission joined forces and completed several studies into various sections of the DNFPPs, lawyers, accountants, and real estate, because they were the last ones now in 2019 to be regulated by the Compliance Commission. Um, category of business falling within the ambit of the section four of the FERA. Again, um, 218, these would have been some of the updated sections. So the studies have assisted in confirm confirming that the automobile sector of the country is low and the domestic banking and gaming sectors were identified as low as well. The gaming um, board and the CBB intended to collaborate on studies of the international real estate and international gaming sectors before the end of 2020 and to verify the level of money laundering terrorist financing risk they pose for the country. Further plans are afoot and working a working group has been established. And again, that working group will consist of the entire financial services sector. So the banks would have gone out to all of their licensees, which is 200 plus, the Securities Commission, the Insurance Commission, and sent out surveys, as well as asked them to internally complete their own risk assessment for their business. And then they will receive all this information combine it and then complete the country's risk assessment. So it's a, it's a grand task, okay? And for a lot of, um, for many years, it wasn't enforced. So now it's enforced. And so now we're getting it done. And um, further plans are foot and a working group established, refreshed the 215, 216 NRA commencing work in its last quarter of 2020 and completion before March, 2021. Now, when is March, 2021? Monday, okay? So your ears should be open. Of course, um, I always say as compliance professionals, we are to read the newspaper every day. We are to stay abreast of what's going on. We are to have the news on our Facebook feeds that makes it easier. And especially if we deal with other countries, we are to have that news feed coming to our Facebook. So Monday, you should have some news, right? And so this is what the government had sent out because there was some riffraff in the House of Assembly where um, the opposition had said, you know, it was the government's fault that we got blacklisted by the European Union. So just last year, um, we were again, you know, because there are many international bodies, you would have learned that probably in the first beginning, you know, there's the Wolfsburg Group, the FATF, the IMF, the European Union. So each of them, you know, um, can blacklist us now because, again, we did complain that the more laws we put in place, the more they ask us for, so we can truly never be compliant. And so, therefore, you know, the FATF and the OECD said, well, we won't blacklist you anymore. Individual countries will blacklist you or individual groups will blacklist you. So, again, the same players are there. 
the same president of France and Germany and uh, part of the European Union. And so subsequently, the Netherlands blacklisted us right away. Germany, France, you know, everybody came at us at once. And so now last year, uh, sorry, a CFATF mutual evaluation was conducted in 2017. And a part of that was to deal with taxation. And so um, the FATF was coming in to ensure that not only did we put an action plan in place and say we are going to update these laws, that we actually did it and it's actually being enforced. So they was coming in to help us and do a verification that, you know, everything was flowing in the country. And they weren't able to come because of the pandemic. So subsequently, again, without notice, even though they had promised us they would let us know, they did not. And they blacklisted us, the European Union. And so in the House of Assembly, other countries had received um, teleconferences because nobody could fly because of the pandemic. However, um, Chester Cooper said that we did not request a teleconference. So the government um, put out this executive summary of everything that they did to fix all the issues and where we are at in this executive summary. And so this is what it is. So it's a very, it's a, how many pages? This is 16 pages. So that part I just showed you at the where they commented on what exactly is happening with the risk assessment where we're at. So I, I hope that they stand. Um, I know it's a lot. I, I, I don't know if, again, you, you are on a learning curve because you would have been operating for 20 years in the same position. Now, all of a sudden, uh, your bank is required, or like, let's think about the credit unions. The credit unions simply did not feel that we operate for 20 years. We never did this before. We know we have a regulator. But truly, we have to do this risk assessment that never been done, and nobody knows what to do. And so it just simply was not done. And then they got fined. Okay, and a lot of institutions, what they did is, when I mean, compliance really makes no money for the business. Um, compliance saves money for the business by avoiding the fines and ensuring that the, the company is compliant. And so therefore, what a lot of organizations did and say, Ms. Bullard, you've been here for 20 years, you're a compliance officer, go to class. And so imagine you now, new compliance officer, not knowing how to function, not knowing what to do, not having any help. You know, there were three or four industry um, updates to tell you exactly what needs to be done and how it should be done. And now you have to meet this deadline in June. What do you do? Along with all the other work that you already have. Okay, and so essentially that's what happened in a lot of um, organizations, not insufficient resources, um, in, you don't even have a system that works to be able to spit out some information, give you a report to tell you where you are. Okay. Um, I was I had a little problem too where um, with the enterprise wide um, risk assessment, managers of various departments' heads did not feel like it was their job. They felt that it was compliance job. So here I am speaking to the credit department. And again, I'm compliance. I only have an overview of the credit department, the credit manager saying, I don't know anything about risk. That's not my job. OK, so there was a battle between who should do what. And some institutions did not even have a risk department or a risk officer. So of course, guess who this fell on? Compliance. Anytime there's a, you know, a lack of staff or a shortage, Compliance can do it, okay? When CRS and FACA came out, compliance can do it. That would make compliance operational, right? Compliance is supposed to be independent of business, non-operational. That created a position where the checker was checking the checker. But the organization is looking at costs and the bottom line, and so that's what you were stuck with, okay? So Chester Cooper said, we didn't ask for teleconference, so in this it says, we asked for the teleconference and they did not respond. Okay, and so this was just an update to say that um, we are working on it. Um, it's been outstanding for a little while, but this is what caused it. All of the sectors were not properly regulated. And then after regulating them, it took us a year or two years. This course is two years to train them properly. 
then to have them believe that they actually had to do this to make the deadline. So that's why the, there's an administrative policy that um, each of the regulators have where they are able to charge you fines and they say, you need this deadline or we charge you, say $5,000 a day, you know? And in my other class where it actually happened to somebody who was just stuck in the class, she had been there for 25 years, they made her the MLRO, she knew nothing about um, compliance, they let her go. She met none of the deadlines. Okay, so, and that's why I, I uh, you know, in my other classes, I encourage you to watch Dirty Money on Netflix because in the HSBC case, it shows you how compliance was manipulated. They, gave, they hired somebody who was not qualified they put them in an office where they could get no extra information and they did not provide them with the proper systems in place to assist them in making, you know, the correct decision. So again, compliance requires a lot of research and it's decision based. If you don't have the resources that you need to make the decisions, more than likely you won't make the right decision. Okay. Um, any any questions so far? So we understand where the Bahamas is at with this risk assessment. And we see that there's a promise for next week. We could start looking in the news to see if it's actually out there or um, it's, if it's coming out to the industry. Okay. So again, that's what the country had to do. And then, of course, we know that we do not want to become high risk. So we had to put sufficient controls in place. Um, one of the initiatives, um, we were seen as too cash intensive. And of course, the people in intro and intermediate know this, that the governor came out with a, um, there's a digital currency out there now um, called, uh, any, what's, what's the name of it? Anybody know? You're too quiet. The sand dollar. It's the sand dollar, yeah. Right. So anybody found out about the sand dollar yet? Anybody using it? What are we doing as compliance professionals to ensure that we know what controls must put in place to protect us against any fraud that could be levied against the sand dollar? Are we investigating or are we waiting until it is, is popular and until our organization says we are not going to accept the sand dollar? Okay, because as you go on to GRC, that's a question that's being asked. Are compliance professionals sufficiently trained? technology-wise, to keep abreast of what's happening in the tech world. Are we? Maria? I believe some institutions are, uh, even though they're not providing the service, they're looking into compliance platforms that can help you detect AML risk or fraud as it relates to digital currencies. But like you're saying, it's still very new to everyone. Um, and I think this is where training comes in, FinTech training. Okay, and so are we familiar with the Securities Commission for the Bahamas, that's the FinTech hub? Are we familiar with that side? Are we looking, are we getting information from there? Have we even no, seen it? Yes. We've seen it and we're familiar. Okay, so we are compliance professionals. When the institution comes and said, we are now gonna accept this digital currency, will this be the first time we start to look or are we now gonna be proactive rather than reactive and, and try and get abreast, try and attend a course, um, you know, get online, see, see what's out there and definitely familiarize yourself with the FinTech Hub. Yeah. Silence. You want to talk back to Miss Bullet? Miss Bullet, you fall asleep. <laughs> talk well, to me. I think I've personally been doing some research on it, but now that you've brought it up, it is a good idea to look into to even help your institution um, even pay for a course who of are course. certain staff members and your and the compliance of person. Course. Of course, yes, very good because we don't want. I mean, it's here. Um, we should have learned from the pandemic that everything went online, right? And so, of course, we initiated our business continuity plans and what have you, but let's not wait. And we see that's like our online is the new norm. So we need to start and think about what risks we are susceptible to um, being online with persons working from home. 
we need to become tech savvy. We can't let, you know, and it's ever changing with the debit cards and the digital currencies and what have you. So please visit the Securities Commission. Please visit the FinTech Hub and do not be left behind. Don't let it just pop up on you and I don't even know what to do. Or, or I'm just starting my research. Okay. Um, to piggyback on what you said, Miss Bullard, um, is Miss Bullard or Mistress Bullard? Mistress Bullard. Okay, Mrs. Bullard, I know the DARE bill would be a good idea to have, even if you don't review it yourself, to have the legal counsels associated with your institution, review it and give a training on it um, because that's, that's directly related to the new digital currency for the Bahamas. Okay, correct. And where do we find this information on the DARE bill? Um, the debt, you can find that information on the devil on the Securities Commission website. Um, I know, I'm not sure if BIF updated their website, but the Bahamas Financial Services Board website also lists uh, recent bills that were enacted. Okay, good, very good. And so again, uh, on that same Securities Commission um, site, that's where you get, you join the FinTech Hub and you follow the updates and the various things that's um, happening, okay? So don't let it sneak up on you, okay? And again, we want to support these initiatives. You know, a lot of times we, we as compliance, we hold up because when they come on with a new product or service, we say, but we don't even know what to do or, you know, what are the risks involved? So be proactive, find out the risk because it's there and it's coming. And again, back to, you know, how I got to this long drawn out story. That was an initiative by the governor of the central bank because we are considered cash intensive. And of course we know the cash intensive businesses are the money services businesses and the gaming houses. So that was one of the initiatives that he implemented. So when we are risk rated, we don't get an overall high risk rating. Okay. Um, another initiative is where he um, decreased the leverage and the leverage has to do, deal with securities. And so um, in recent times, a lot of broker deals had, had popped up because our leverage was a lot higher um, than other countries. And I think it was at 400 and now he reduced it to 200, which will still allow us to be competitive, okay? And so it's, um, it's still a bit higher than the UK and, and Switzerland and, and what have you. And so these are various initiatives that were put in place to assist the country. And so when you see um, the effects falling on your, um, you know, your clients, you wanna ensure that you have the proper information to explain to them, they explain to the clients that, hey, these are initiatives to ensure that, you know, our financial services set is, is protected, that um, we are not risk rated as high risk. And then a lot of, you know, businesses and banks and countries pull out from doing business with us, okay? So again, with the risk rating or the risk assessment, a lot of times we have, we put all of these policies and procedures, we document everything. We're good with writing down on paper. And then once we write it down on paper, we never look back at it, okay? And so one of the things um, that the book talks about is that the risk rating is just as good as today. Today, Ms. Bullard is, and I always say that I'm the teacher, I'm the lecturer, and right out of this class, I feel a little bit of struggle from the pandemic, I go out and commit a crime. I go out and co commit a fraud, right? And so today, Ms. Bullard was low risk, and tomorrow, she could be hauled before the courts, okay? So the risk rating or this risk assessment is only good as it, it, it ever changes, it, 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 it comp always revolves, okay? so. You don't want to just write it on paper and leave it, okay? When you write it down, you want to have, have a version date and an expiry date. You want to ensure that even your risk rating or your risk assessment has an expiry date. And I think the, the regulators are moving towards whether you are risk rated high, medium, or low. And so if you're risk rated high, then your risk assessment should be reviewed, not that you have to make any changes. If you don't have any new products or new services or what have you, then that you can just sign off 
annually and say no changes. But that means that you look through it and you review it. If you're medium, every two years. If you're high risk, every year. If you're low risk, every three years. Okay. And then again, like I said, we're good to writing these things on paper and we're just so happy we finished this policy, this procedure, or this assessment, and then we never look back at it. And then another thing is that we can't even explain it. So I always talk about methodology, okay? And so again, the persons in, in, who were intermediate, should, they should understand what methodology is. And methodology is just how did you come up, like they're gonna rate, risk rate us medium high or high. And of course, if we, we are risk rated high, we're gonna have some questions, right? We're not just gonna accept high. On which basis will we risk rated high, okay? And so I want you to bear in mind that when you do your assessments, because the risk assessment starts at the country level, then at the company level, and then you risk assess the, the clients, right? And so when you risk assess the clients, you wanna understand, you wanna be able to explain it. Because a lot of times we have risk ratings and we don't know how to explain it, okay? And so if we look at the screen, can we see the screen? No. Yeah. Oh, no. I don't yeah, see okay. Anything. This is I the would. methodology from the Basel Committee. And again, the Basel Committee and Transparency International, that's who risk rate countries. Okay. And that's where we get the majority of our data from. And so when we finish this risk rating on Monday, which they promise, we are going to, if they're we're risk rated high, we're going to ask them based on what, okay? Based, based on what? Okay, so my screen in the room came off. So we're going to ask them um, based on what? Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. We see the methodology? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, so see. this is what goes into it. So 65% is the quality of your AML framework for your country. Um, 10% is your corruption risk. And of course, we know there's a CPI index. Okay, it's back up. Yeah, of course, we know there's a corruption perception index as well. So there's 10%. Um, and of course, for the first time, we see our politicians being brought before the courts. However, our, thank God, our CPI index only dropped by one point. But again, we can question them. These are the various standards. Now, we normally don't share our internal risk assessment with our clients. But if our clients were to come in and ask us, how will we assess? Or forget about the clients, because the regulators do come in and ask, or it does come in and ask, how are you assessing these um, clients? Do we really know? Can we explain? Normally, risk ratings have country rating. Country rating of where you do business. Where are we getting that information from? Do we know? Because you didn't risk rate Afghanistan as high or Mexico as high. So who determines what is the methodology for your internal risk assessment? As compliance professionals, as the owner of the risk rating, you should know. Okay? So go back to your institutions and, and check it. A lot of us have an Excel sheet. And if we have five persons in the compliance department, we have five versions of that Excel sheet. And then when one person is absent and the person comes to review, we say, email me a copy of that risk assessment. And so that picks up microbes. Uh, there's something called end user computing when in Excel, there's microbes and all sorts of stuff that can happen. So at the end, your formulas are not correct. Is anybody checking? Wow. Why are we wowing? Is this true? But so first, we can't explain it. Second of all, it may be assessing these um, clients incorrectly. Right? And then thirdly, um, if we say, where do you get your country risk ratings from? Okay, we use Transparency International or we use um, the Basel Committee. Each year, this is updated. If you look at the version date in the corner of your risk rating form, that have 2,003 on it. But the battle committee updates every year. So sometimes there's minimal changes, but gone are those days. As of 2018, again, we are on enforcement. So each year, 
if you are the owner, the compliance department is the owner of that form, you have to go and check these source where you get your source from. Okay, and ensure that the rating is the same because today we are medium. Tomorrow, on Monday, when our assessment is done and this is submitted, in six months we should get a rating or one year we should have a, a new rating. It may be high risk. And then we have to go on damage control. Okay, so we need to be aware of what the initiatives are to keep us at medium and support them because we already have junk statuses. We can't take a high risk rating as well, okay? Okay, so my whole point is understand the methodology and in your business. And when you risk rate these persons, ensure that you check it, your forms are up to date and you can explain it when the auditors or central bank comes in, because again, we have a lot of things on paper, we document it, and we just glad we finish it and we throw it away and never look back at it again because we are overwhelmed and overworked and short staff and life happens. Right? And so you want to ensure um, that these things are current and up to date. Because I went to a seminar to where the regulator said across the board, industry wide, most risk ratings were deficient, okay? And so gone are the days when you get a slap on the wrist and say, this person should have been high risk but you have them at medium, okay? So you get a fine or you get let go. And of course we know the law was, you know, extended before you suggest be the MLRO that went to jail. Now everybody goes to jail, all the parties involved, all the people who say we have ate it, 100 clients, how are we supposed to know everyone? Your institution has to have the proper metrics in place, okay? If you have 800 clients, there's no way in the world one person can know all those clients, you know? And so I've seen in a lot of banks where they don't want to assign clients to, to officers. If you have 800 clients, you have to ensure that those clients are properly risk rated, high, medium, or low, and then each Officer probably has a hundred clients. And then that's manageable, then that's achievable. Then you can know those clients intimately, okay? Or you could build relationships with those clients. But if 800 clients and five of us work in the department and anybody who picks it up, it goes to a generic box and anybody who picks up that instruction carries it out, do you truly know that client? No, so the institutions have to help and compliance has to insist that we have metrics in place. If you're junior and you're senior, so the seniors should have the majority of the high risk, the juniors should have one to five to practice, right? And then the juniors should have the majority of the medium and um, medium and low risk. And again, again, this is another control. And this is one of the controls that you could document that I have proper metrics in place. I have a ratio from staff to clients to ensure that, you know, we don't overlook these things. And uh, nobody's overwhelmed or nobody, I, I dealt with Ms. Bullard once. I never served her again for three years. So I don't, I, I can't comment on her transaction history. I don't know her profile. I don't know who she is, you know? And I've been in meetings where staff said, how are we expected to know all these clients? Okay, don't sign up for these jobs if you, you can't follow the rules because you can't go to jail. You are expected to know. If your institution does not have proper metrics in place, you must insist that they put something in place. Okay, and another good thing that I saw that in terms of metrics is I see there's a head of the European desk. So a particular group would deal with all the people from Europe and then you can pick up patents and then you would be able to determine, hey, this is out of character. Um, they, you know, this may be suspicious. There's a head of the Asian desk. There's a head of the Latin American desk. But if you're dealing with Asia, Latin America, you don't know. Or you could divide it by sectors. I deal with the accountants. You deal with the lawyers. You, you know, 
but you have to have some structure in place or it'll be very difficult to know these clients and carry out um, proper assessments on each. Okay? And then a lot of times or in the past, everything was compliance, compliance, compliance was expected to know. Yes, compliance is expected to know, but this is not a one-man band. Compliance is everybody's business. Everybody has a responsibility. And so what institutions need to do is on your job description, you put that it's, you know, you abide by the AML laws and, and what have you, and that makes everybody accountable. So they stop passing the buck and saying, well, I, I don't deal with this and I don't understand, especially if you're ahead of the department. You are responsible. Compliance cannot be responsible for the credit policies and the HR policies and the finance policies. We have experts in those departments. Okay, so compliance should be on a body where or committee where they review. Once you would have finished, they review it from the compliance aspect or from the risk aspect to ensure that you properly documented the risk to help you create probabilities or scenarios. But the act of, you know, having compliance do the entire assessment or write the entire policy is not correct because they are not expert in finance. They are not expert in, in, in um, HR. So it, it, it's the organization as a whole. And so for a long time, compliance has some, in some cases, hoarded the information and wanted to be, you know, the most important person or everybody has to come to me, type the situation or, or people in the organization, you know, that just became the culture where you go to compliance. And even with um, questions and, and risk-related, um, you know, issues at one particular uh, institution I worked, almost at 12 o'clock in the day, I was answering questions because people did not do their work um, research. And it was very hard to train the staff to say, hey, if you have a question, Google is there. Policies and procedures are there. You know, I always say we, we use the central bank guidelines as our Bible. Go and see what's happening internationally. Go see what's happening um, with the central bank guidelines. We do your research and then come and ask the question. And half of the time, you may not even need to come to compliance to ask. But we don't have these organizations trained properly. We have the entire organization depending on compliance. Right? Okay, so compliance is decision based. You do research, then you make a decision. There's no operations manual that says press one, then enter, then you get spit out a report. You know, you do your research, and that's why I encourage um, the persons from intro to start your library, build your network, because you won't have all the answers and you will need help. And the organization just recently, I needed a legal opinion, and they said, no, we're not paid. So I had to call all my legal friends to, to get advice. And then I had, I think, some one, two persons in, in this class, I shoot a question at them. I say, okay, I know, I now know what to do, but you have to build your network. Okay? And you have to do your research. So you want to ensure that, you know, the risk-based approach makes sense, that you have proper controls in place. And again, the most familiar um, example I have is of our pets, because everybody's familiar with the politically exposed people, right? And again, what would be our control in place? Our control in place is that annually, we let the board review our pets, or at approval, the board has to approve our pets. Normally, for new accounts, the low and medium risk is approved by compliance. The high risk is approved by like an AML committee, where the risk officer, the CEO, the finance officer sits, and then PEPs are approved by the board. So that's control. We let the board approve. Our next control is that we'll label it as high risk. Our next control is that we'll get a report. Um, you know, we have a lot of investigators out there. There's a group called Proximal um, World Check, it does a lot of um, background searches. And it's for a fee, but these are the controls that you put in place too mitigate the risk against pets. Okay? And then another control, 
you know, this in your AML um, directive. You have something termed undesirable accounts. And in those undesirable accounts, you can either say persons that are charged, as we see Shane Gibson, um, Kendrick Dorsett, and whoever was probably put across. They were acquitted, right? But could you imagine the institutions where they have accounts? I'm sure they, they have accounts. Who, who makes the decision? Are we going to do risk them? Are they going to, are we going to, you know, and we'll talk about that more in exit and exit, um, the exit process and escalation policy in, in 10 and 11. Okay? Who makes that decision? But again, you want to have all of this in place. And you, we don't want to be like Enron, where we write a bunch of baseless st st um, statements and we never look back at it. It just collects us. Nobody reads the policy because there's too many pages. And we all know we have difficulty reading. Right? And so we want to review, risk rate these policies, um, check them to ensure that this is what we're doing. Because there was a, a, a you know, we did audit somewhere that said an undesirable account was an account where somebody was charged. But yet the account was still open. So what, what do you think happened to that institution? They have it in policy, an undesirable account is an, an account where somebody was charged and the person still had the account open on the books and they were charged. Well, yeah. And essentially that's what happens where well. that's how you get audit notes. Your policy and your procedure must match to what you're actually doing. Another issue is I see that people don't categorize PEPs properly. We had somebody saying, I am the head of the Drug Enforcement Unit reporting to the Prime Minister or the Drug Enforcement Association reporting to the Prime Minister. Is that a PEP? Okay. And also, in we have to understand that PEP has a different definition depending on which country you're dealing with. Mexico's PEP definition is more stringent than the UK. Are we aware of that for us that are dealing with international um, countries and, and clients? Do we make note anywhere? Or when something happens, we say, oh my God, oh my God, let's look at this account that, that we do a damage control. Okay, so you want to ensure that you do proper reviews and you understand and and it's a lot of, it's very comprehensive. You, you can't know, or Ms. Bullet don't even know all of this. I have to go and do research, you know, but you, this is why you want to put proper policy and procedure in place. After you would have done it, you want somebody else to check it. You can't have the checker checking the checker. I make a lot of mistakes when I check myself. Okay, so you need that four eyes to check or a group or a, a committee to, to come behind you and verify. And then you want somebody to test. Is this really effective? Even when we risk rate products and services, we have a new product coming on stream. We want to go out and let the staff get the debit card and let them use it for a month first before we send it out to the public so we could see the issues that, you know, that come out of it. But a lot of times we don't have time for that, right? And until something goes wrong, okay? And then we know that the hackers and the scammers, um, scammers, they, they said all day from nine to five, that's their job to infiltrate the system. We are overwhelmed trying to keep up to date, you know, and it's so bad. I went to another seminar where a lady stood up and he, and she said, you know, to the attorney general, um, the updates to the law are going out to the public the same time it comes out to the industry. These people are sitting home waiting for the law to come out so they know how to work around it. We are just on a learning curve, trying to understand it, trying to go out and get training. Can you please send the updates of the law out to the industry and give us three months and then send it out to the public? And some people laugh, but that's very valid. Because these people are getting more savvy and more savvy. And after you would put your risk assessment in place and tested it, tried it, and I'd say it's airproof, um, 
we can't eliminate risk, we can mitigate it. After you think that you have something out of control, under control, like the ATM scammers, they sat in front, to me, they sat in front of Royal Bank getting internet for months. And lo and behold, then they had a card in the ATM. And to me, it was one of them who was sitting out there getting the internet at night. I know it was the cruise ship people, but that was a ATM that was constantly hit the Royal Bank downtown. And so when we fix that problem and put more controls in place to ensure that they could not put the card reader in or what have you to scan that, they move on to something else. They don't stop. So just how they are moving on and being continuous, that's how you have to move on. Okay? And then you cannot put it in place and then leave it. Uh, this is why you risk rate every product and service because you want a reminder to check back on it. You'd be lucky if it's a, a low risk rating so you don't have to check it every three years, till every three years. But you may have some, most cases is risk rating. Coming in broken, mom. Yeah, you have to check back yeah. on it to make sure it's airtight and have. Miss Fuller, I think we're losing you on the connection. Mm -hmm. you can no. hear me. No, I can't. 